All right, everyone. Welcome to another episode of the Gestalt Education Show. We are uh, pleased to be sitting down with a true clinical savant, uh, Robert Lardner. So we are at his office here in Chicago. Um, I first, well, I first learned from Robert at a manual therapy course in Columbus, a DNS manual therapy. And uh, it should have honestly just been called, uh, you know, Robert's Bag of Tricks. Or <laughs> it was so amazing because it was it, it added so many different things into one. And um, that's why I've been so excited to, to have this conversation with Robert. And I know Brett has too because, I mean, probably, nobody's probably been exposed to more things in, in the manual therapy and just in treatment world than Robert Lardner. And so... Um, yeah. yeah, he's just an absolute gem. I mean, I've known Robert for 20 years, yeah. and uh, I think the thing that I've grown to appreciate about Robert is the treatment room is literally the playground, and I feel people like you, Robert, you never burn out at this because it's just like this constant journey that we're all on to try to figure this out. And uh, yeah, maybe we'll start with and a good opening question would just be, let's talk about your journey in all of this. <laughs> Wow. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for coming mm -hmm. and interviewing me. I'm honored to be asked to do this podcast. Um, my journey started, I think, when I first um, wanted to dance, when I saw people in movement, and I was just fascinated at, at people jumping in the air. And I think I was even more fascinated because since there were pictures, I didn't see them land. So you were just looking at a picture of somebody in the air. You go, how does someone do that? And so eventually I got to be a dancer and um, I was more fascinated about the act of dancing than even the performance. The performance was fun. But I was fascinated by how the body moved through or achieved the movement and could repeat it and reproduce it on stage, under, under tension, uh, um, in leisure. So that was it. And um, as I, I was injured uh, during my dancing, uh, my short career, and I was fascinated that we, I did not know how to do a, a proper rehabilitation intervention, and nor did the PTs. They were, <laughs> they were almost as lost as I was, <laughs> because there was no great um, set way of evaluating the body. And a dance was so much about integrated movement that if you didn't have a way of assessing it, you were done back to the nuts and bolts, just, you know, east into the foot, some VMO exercises, and so on, and that was it. Um, luckily, I think Pilates arrived on the scene, on the dance scene, in, uh, during that time, and so then it became the rage, because it was one of the few integrated movement therapies that seemed to have an effect on how... Uh, people were dancing and how they were moving. But it still did not give you great uh, standard analysis of movement. It was rarely dependent on the teacher's eye and what he thought you should be doing and what he had learned from a strict codex of rules that uh, Joseph Pilates had handed down through his protégés. And, of course, that got diluted or altered over time, and you had different schools practicing different versions of Pilates. But that really was um, the um, opening uh, to my uh, adventure in looking at movement and then deciding to go into physical therapy when I stopped dancing. Very good. So how did you get introduced to the Prague School? What was your entry point for... Um, for that. Luckily, um, we had had exposure to Yanda's muscle testing book as part of our curriculum at the uh, Bern University where I went for physical therapy. So I knew about Yanda and um, we, he seemed so fascinating because he spoke of function and these muscle tests seemed um, a far cry from what was being uh, done um, in, in, even in our syllabus, uh, when Yanda stood out in our syllabus because of this. And then there were, um, there were um, 
other um, Rose Zetterstrom, she was a PT who was starting to look at function. She was treating sports athletes and so on, and we had the privilege of being at her clinic. So between these two things, I had an idea that whatever I was learning was going to be quite inadequate for my career, uh, for, as a right. career in physical therapy. I was like, there is nothing I've learned so far that makes me confident that I can treat everybody because I could see the glimpses of things that should be, but were not. Mm. So um, when I got to Chicago, um, a chiropractor, I ended up working with a chiropractor and she said that Yambo was coming to National in Lombard and he was going to give a talk on gait and would I be interested? <laughs> oh boy, was I interested. I was sleepless with anticipation <laughs> because he had only heard about him and um, Oh, and also, uh, whilst I was in Sweden, I'd gone to a book fair with a friend of mine, and we found Levitt's book on the locomotive system, rehabilitation book. So when I saw this, I was like, why don't we have this book in our... Book? The book is amazing. Yeah. Still I was like, day. this is the book we should be learning from, mm -hmm. and this should be the basis of rehabilitation. So I knew from that moment on that... I was in deep trouble because we didn't know this information, right. and yet I was in a few months going to be seeing patients. So with Yanda, yes. you know, I feel like sometimes in the Prague school, you know, because we're all just so mesmerized by uh, by Pavel and things yeah. that Yanda and Levitt, you know, we we don't expose enough of some of their huge uh, attributes and contributions. So let's start with Yanda. What do you think? should still be plugged in from Yanda's body of work as far as assessment, treatment? Like what, what do we still need to be teaching from what Yanda taught you and, and others? Um, I think that Yanda's description of the rehabilitation process is still valid. Uh, you can use many synonyms to describe the, the process, but it is basically this. You must assess afferent quality. What is being put into <clears throat> the CNS process? You must have a, a, a good understanding that the resources, the building blocks of afferent information that is coming to the CNS is adequate and of a quality that will allow change in the afferent outcome. Yanda always said the first thing to do was to make sure that the quality of affluence was adequate and good. And that has not changed. Um, we must then observe the central nervous system in its processing uh, function, how well it processes the incoming information. And then we must look at the output. What is the motor outcome of that process? Many times in rehabilitation, we focus on the outcome and we try to change the outcome with no change to input. <laughs> that is very inefficient mm -hmm. and it just stresses the system more. The, the, the stressor, <clears throat> the stressor, any afferent change is a stress upon the system. So we must appreciate and evaluate what are the stresses on the system that are resulting in aberrant motor function or inefficient motor expression, etc. So Yanda said, first, improve the quality of afferents. And then secondly, improve the balance of muscle tone within the body. This um, feeds into sympathetic, parasympathetic balance or homeostasis. <clears throat> and then he also said you must retrain reflexively the movement patterns. And that is still to a great deal pertinent. We must find ways in which the input and the process results in spontaneous change and adaptation. If you are only concerned in instructing about changing the output, 
and the patient does not have adequate resources, you are going to short circuit the system eventually because he does not have the resources to yeah, it's all changes. Mm -hmm. Yes. So this this has not changed, not from the day he uttered he uttered those words and described them as such. It is still pertinent today. We can use different words, but the principles have not changed. In the seventies, you know, he classified the muscles into postural and phasic muscles. Mm -hmm. And I know you've been through the Capendulum books and articles, and mm -hmm. those are just underrated in themselves. But mm -hmm. I want you to comment, Robert, do you think that's an adequate way? Do you still think that's correct to, to teach students the two, the postural and the phasic muscles? Because I know Kolash has kind of debated on whether or not that's mm -hmm. actually correct. Mm -hmm. But what are your thoughts on that? Um, I think that we have moved forward in our understanding of the muscle function um, and therefore whilst it is um, helpful to have a sense of uh, typical behavior of certain muscle groups, it is far from the whole picture. Um, the important thing that Yanda brought uh, to the table which is a is an important factor is that muscle inhibition um, also exists. It is not just weakness and strength, but inhibition. And, um, uh, and we also know that you can have an inability for a muscle to relax at all. It is overactive and cannot normalize its, its um, activity. So between these four areas, whilst you might have a genetic predisposition for certain muscles to become tighter and to become contracted and others to um, give up, to become lax or less active, you also have the interplay where changing circumstances, environment, both internal and external, can alter these, this, this basic relationship quite significantly. So you cannot assume, for example, that just because a muscle that has a tendency to be tight is tight, it needs to be stretched and relaxed because it could be inhibited at the same time. Right. <laughs> yes. yes. So you have to take this into account. So yes, there is um, um, a need, I think, to teach to some degree uh, the tendencies of muscle groups to overwork or underwork. But even more importantly is to assess what is the state of this muscle group and how do you integrate it within a global pattern of movement because that is really where it shines. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Is there still a role for sensory motor devices, whether that's wobble sandals, wobble boards? Do we still, you know, do you still have a place for that in your current yeah. paradigm? Yes, there is a role for these. Um, are they um, of um, do they play the same role they did before? Not as much. But it is sometimes important to challenge the patient's um, fixed point and <clears throat> to um, turn on equilibrium reactions, balance reactions, uprighting reactions by introducing in, uh, instability into the system. Um, one of the um, uh, one thing that is important is that the instability is not so great that it creates a panic situation for mm -hmm. the body, and a, because then it will become um, it will just desperately seek safety, right? And that is not the goal of, of training um, uh, of uh, sensory motor training. But then again, sensory motor training covers it used to have a much narrower definition. All our training is sensory motor training, whether it involves unstable apparatus or not. Um, and so um, there is a room for this, but it must be graded and it must not exceed the body's own ability to control 
the on the perturbed motion. Yanda, you know, he kind of made himself famous for his ability to observe. Mm -hmm. So could you comment on, I think the two things that, that I always think about, and he was before my time, but he was kind of known for his gait evaluation and his postural mm -hmm. examination. Mm -hmm. Maybe if you could make an argument for our listeners on why that skill is important, because I feel like in chiropractic or physical therapy school, you're taught like, Parkinsonian gait or cerebral mm -hmm. palsy gait, you're taught these mm -hmm. gait evaluations that you're never really going to be utilizing mm -hmm. in practice. Mm -hmm. So could you talk about the importance of a good gait evaluation and uh, posture exam? Um, I think that the important uh, aspect is that the, the expression of gait, the expression of posture, is directly linked to the CNS's um, integration of information. So if you are really paying attention, you should see the CNS captured in its outer expression, in, in, in habitual movement patterns. These include posture, breathing, gait, uh, fine motor function. These are so repetitive that as the C if the CNS runs into trouble in processing, in its uh, ability to integrate, you should see aberrations in these very, very, um, what would you say, very monotone functions that are easy that have we have seen so long that we have rules about what we expect to see. It is like a flight. If I see a bird flying, there's a certain way in which it flies. It, it, all birds are built in such a way <laughs> that their flight is kind of characteristic for their species. So if I see a bird flying backwards, I go, ooh, that's aberrant. <laughs> <laughs> Something wrong. Yes. yes? So this is where the strength of observation comes in. And uh, it is important to train your eye and look at the building blocks of what uh, constitutes that movement or that posture. And that is something that I think has been really uh, important when we looked at the developmental sequence in DNS. It gives you an insight into the building blocks, what is expected to compose a posture. And that should be a good starting reference point for the practitioner to look and see what are the changes that are not in keeping with what you would expect of the normal movement patterns that you observe almost unconsciously all day long. So. No, that's really good. So what are some things in posture or gait, Robert, that that you're looking at? Like, how does your brain kind of work? If we have somebody who's walking in front of us right now, how does you how do you systematically observe someone's gait or posture for that matter? Um, well, uh, with the posture, I am trying to look at the uh, the ease with which the person stands. If it is constrained and how the limbs are distributed in relationship to his center of gravity. So it is really uh, that, um, the weight of the head, how is that carried? Um, and that goes again into breathing. Um, how is the patient breathing? What muscle tensions, even in the standing posture, can I see? And then I am looking for things that I must test. Just observing alone is not sufficient because it could mean anything. It's like an uneven level of the shoulder blades. If the right is higher than the left or the left is higher than the right, that's all you can say. You cannot choose one to be better mm -hmm. than right. the other. Mm -hmm. That, is, uh, that is, would be a stupid assumption. You must uh, first see the aberration and you must ask yourself, what could it mean? And then you must have uh, collect enough data to see if it is meaningful 
in the terms of rehabilitation. And that means you must assess. If you are not assessing, then you are guessing. I think um, I did not coin that phrase. I it's think. a play on words. Did you get to see what he did there? That, see what that, he did there? No, but it is uh, um, this uh, gentleman uh, who, who said this. Um, I can't remember his name, but he's a well-known rehabilitation expert. So you must at all times say, OK, I see this. What does it mean? And it is only through movement, assessment, testing, that you can start to garner or infer, yes, this side has a problem, that side does not. Or it has a coping uh, strategy, the side does not. And from there, you start to build up your, uh, your hypothesis of what the intervention should be. But there is no point in looking at posture and making inferences from it without the ability to assess what you think is wrong with this posture. It's a waste of time. I think we say sometimes, like, it would be soft findings. <clears throat> like, it's leading yeah, you to yes. the next These thing. are soft findings, and they are points of data collection. They are not in themselves indications for treatment. They are points of data. They're just information that you must collect and then use that to decide what tests you're going to oh, do. That's perfect. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love it. It's really yeah. good. Okay. So and it's the same thing for gait. Um, whether I see diminished hip extension in walking, a uh, lack of weight shift from side to side. The person has, an, um, for instance, the, the movement of the torso is it, has it got a Trendelenburg uh, characteristic? One of the things you often see is that the shoulders are moved from side to side instead of the hips. This is a big problem because it means that you must accelerate <laughs> the weight shift <laughs> and quickly decelerate it. It is inefficient. Um, it takes away from rotation. Once you start swinging side to side, each plane that is in excess must take it from the other plane. <laughs> yes. Yeah, oh, for sure. Yeah. So this um, is, it is necessary to see which planes are poorly controlled during gait. And that is the most important thing. Uh, in your model of care, Robert, mm -hmm. would you say if you put in your intervention, you would expect those findings that you're talking about right now to just self-regulate and improve? Or do you feel like that if you wanted to change the patient's gait, if that was one of the metrics you wanted to change, do you have to have them put thought into their walking to change it? Or are you just relying on your treatment to make the change that you would be looking for? Or do you feel like it just doesn't matter I mean, because I've heard others who have been around Yanda say the, his goal wasn't necessarily to change the gate, but the gate was what was telling him what he needed to do from a treatment standpoint. That's it. And you need to know what you need to do from a treatment standpoint to change the afferents input. Um, and uh, with that, you can get... Um, a change, a spontaneous change in the efferent output. However, the there is the problem of habit and awareness. The patient um, has uh, may have a tendency to override. <laughs> the, the input that you are trying because it's you, so hardwired, yeah. Yes, mm -hmm. you, because in order to change something, the summation of the afferents must be great enough to overcome <laughs> the, sure. the, yeah, the, 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 yeah. the resistance within the system. The habitual function you have to stimulate something so much more that that, that choice is made to to focus on the new sensation. And is that fight worth it with our everyday patients? It's or do we just reserve that for really high-end movers? Or, you know, where, how can we plug that in, do you think? Or where do we plug I that in? I think it is um, not every patient 
needs uh, this kind of uh, treatment. Um, it depends what the problem is and how deeply ingrained it is. That really is what. It, it, this is not a question of whether this person is an athlete or, uh, or not. It is how core is the movement quality and what is the consequence for that person given their ADL functions mm. uh, in life. Because that is where you have to decide whether you're going to help them or not. And if you do not have the time, then you should tell them that you do not. Love it. Um, so then, before we leave Yanda, Yanda also became famous for his six functional tests. And I love the story uh, that Clayton Skaggs told me. He said they were in Buffalo for a course and someone raised their hand and they said, when you're doing your six tests, and Yanda turned around and said, I haven't done those six tests in 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> Basically meaning he'd earn the right to take a shortcut, etc. Yeah, right. So, but let's just take, you know, I cut my teeth on like the hip extension test, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Is there still a role for off weight bearing movement tests like the hip extension test or the hip abduction test? Do you feel like those should still be in our battery of assessment or we're kind of beyond that at this point and uh, not necessary? Hmm. Um, Do you still use the hip extension test? Would be a way, different way to say it. A different way to say it. I use it in passing. It is baked into other assessments. So it's not like I go, okay, I'm going to have the patient lie down, say lift your left leg, lift your right leg. But um, I am, at times, I'm looking at the whole chain and I want to see what the activation should be. And I may ask him to lift his leg in order to see that function. But even more importantly, I'll put him in a position where I can isolate his ability to lift his leg and see if the hip, if the glute is up to it or not. Right. That is more important to me. Um, and again, the test itself is not directly going to be, well, I've got to fix that glute. I've got to strengthen the glute. <laughs> That's yeah, right. right. <laughs> there is, you go, I am collecting data about how this person moves. I'm collecting data about his ability to activate. And then I need to see it in, a, in, um, in function. And what I say is that you have... You have data collection, which just tells you information about the patient, how he does things. Uh, and then you have provocation. I stress you and I see your response. That is a, a, a second layer of, of information. And then I ask you to do movements that are related to the developmental sequence. I want to see if you retain the building blocks of those movements in the background of your your activities. Oh, yeah. so well said. Mm -hmm. So articulated so well. Yeah. And then the last thing is I want to see you do synergistic movements, movements that you use in every day, a function that are a consequence of this. Push, pull, squat, lunge, twist, um, uh, lift over, you know, things that may require equipment that you use yeah. that is specific to your day. Then I have a whole information range that I can now use to determine what is my treatment solution for this person. And again, as I said, it can be for an athlete or it can be for someone who just works in an office. But the question is, given what he has to do, what his uh, leisure uh, activities are, what is he capable of, how does he do it, and is that efficient or just effective? Hmm. This is absolute clinical gold. So I think the best clinicians in the world, Robert, they collect their data, but what makes them so good is they then know you know, off of what they've learned with the patient, they know where their portal of entry should be. That's what makes these clinicians so good. Um, 
your data collection, how long does that take? What are, what are your audits that you're coming back? What are what, what what information is important for you to gather in your assessment? Okay, so I look for distortion of the posture because once you are standing upright, the, the gravity is a constant stress. There are two stresses that we cannot escape. One is pressure and one is gravity. Um, this was uh, mentioned by um, uh, Tom Hushka, uh, I think. Here I? Yes. Ron Hushka. Ron Here. Hushka. Yes, in that he mentioned this. And this is so true. We have to handle pressure. Breathing is pressure management. It is constant. You cannot escape it. Gravity is weight management. It is constant. You cannot escape it. So your posture answers those two stresses at all times. It's telling me how am I managing this and it's not going away. So I collect the distortions that I see. I look at the breathing. I look at what is the available range of motion for that patient, especially within the extremities, because the extremities flow from the core, and if there's something wrong with the core, the extremities will reflect that dysfunction. Ah. They have to. So you look at that, and then I look at the trigger point chains in the most relaxed position, which is lying down, because lying down you should be as relaxed as you can get <laughs> under those two stresses. Right. Yes. So if you're still displaying significant trigger points, it means you are unable to fully relax. Something is left in the machine, like a, like a McDonald's paper bag in the back seat. You must, you must go, oh, what's this doing here? Right. Yeah, you know, the car was completely clean. <laughs> right. So it's just the same thing. So the trigger point chain tells you that there are chains that are under more stress or chronic stress. And when you lie down, they are still unable to, to normalize. And then the last is the strength testing. The strength testing is done to get an idea of how well the integrated um, system can, through um, uh, leverage, produce force. Because when I ask you for strength, I'm not only testing one muscle. I'm testing its ability to leverage itself of fixed points all through the body. And How to attenuate load. Yes, you know, that's I, right. And people just have this mixed up. And unfortunately, I think muscle testing gets such a bad rap because it's taught that way. Yeah. You're almost, I mean, if you're checking your hip flexors, you're the last thing you're doing is checking the hip flexors. That's you're right. actually checking the ability the to stabilize. Exactly. of the system right. is challenged. And I must know in which planes it is challenged, where the patient can still use efficient uh, muscle activity and where he or she cannot. And we're, we're going to come back to that because I definitely want to uh, pick your brain a little bit more on that. But I want to uh, move on to Levitt for a second. Mm -hmm. So we're kind of closing the door mm -hmm. on Yanda. Mm -hmm. uh, in your book here, we have this quote, in patients with chronic musculoskeletal pain, the source of the pain is rarely the actual cause of the pain. In fact, Czech physician Carol Levitt noted he who treats the side of pain is often lost. And this is kind of one of his famous mm -hmm. quotes that he was, he's kind of like Winston Churchill and he's very <laughs> quotable, very quotable. Yes, but yes. Um, yeah. so if we're not chasing pain in this system mm -hmm. versus other systems like MDT, where we're really assessing pain and things like that, mm -hmm. um, can you explain the importance of why we can't only use pain as an outcome measure and how we have to truly be great at being able to assess the function of our, of our patients. The problem with pain is that it is conscious perception. Mm. So pain exists only when it is made conscious. Nociception is quite a different matter. 
nociception is the first indication of discomfort of the CNS. But it is not necessarily conscious, and therefore, by the time you get to pain, it is it has gone through many stages. So many layers, yeah. Yeah. So it's like trying to evaluate the uh, the pee under the mattress by touching the blanket on top <laughs> and going, you know what? As soon as I as this blanket feels flat, I'm going to stop my rehabilitation intervention. <laughs> wow. You will get nowhere with that because you have ignored the fact that pain is the end point of a long process of dysfunction. So if you're going to make a change, that is not your measuring tool. It is too clumsy a tool to use. Listen to this quote about pain in, uh, in your book here. Yanda believed that pain is the only way the musculoskeletal system can protect itself. Wow. Isn't that a great quote? Yeah, I mean, that, right. yeah. When it has run out of options, it presents you with pain to stop right. <laughs> as much yeah, movement right. as possible. Your body is always monitoring nociception <laughs> and making adjustments accordingly to allow you to function in a world that is unforgiving should your function become significantly uh, limited. Yeah, and the majority of this is subconscious. <laughs> exactly. You don't realize your body is doing Your body this. is interested in your survival. So it is looking for options, and if it meets nociception, it turns the other way. It meets nociception, it finds a solution. It meets nos. Finally, if it runs out of solutions, it, it writes you a check for pain, <laughs> and it sends it to you, and it says you need to stop. That's what it does. So you cannot act on the final check. You must have asked the body, hey, how did we come to owe this money at all? That's when rehabilitation starts. Right. You must find out how did it come to this <laughs> that you are now in pain. Wow. What a great so, explanation. Yeah. So Levitt, also known for uh, finding the key link mm -hmm. in a patient's case. Mm -hmm. So this is going to dovetail uh, perfectly in kind of what we're talking about now. So what... What are the things that allow us to get to the key link? Is it as simple as after you've uh, collected your data, you're finding the most dysfunctional thing? How do you sort your way through that? The, the having collected your data and done your testing, your provocation test, you must stress the body and see its response. From this response, you get information. But the first thing I must do, personally for me, is to, is to um, what I say is unfold the body, smooth it out, because it is showing me compensation to stresses that it has had to deal with. So I say to people, the body is crooked when it comes to you. It is crooked. It is bearing the scars of all those decisions about nociception that it has made over time. And it is just showing you the end point at that moment. So the first thing, if you want to understand how crooked it is, is to straighten it out. Then you will see it unfold and see where it came from, kind of. So you must take it back in its history, so to speak. So the first thing you must do, in my mind, is to take away the, uh, the, po the posture itself that is now almost uh, the cause of the problem. And by that I mean, if I've made so many compensations that I'm so limited, the first thing I must do is to restore the ability to relax, to relax the posture. And so I start by trying to eliminate as much of this uh, postural compensation as possible so that I am working towards a cleaner template on which to, um, to uh, help the patient rewrite or re or, or reacquaint himself with 
a, a better quality of movement. So that is the first thing, because within all that is presented to you is in the body is both cause and compensation. It's a mixed, <laughs> it's a mixed presentation. It goes, I'm standing like this because I'm in pain. I'm also standing like this because of whatever caused me the problem in the first place. So how do you find out which one's which? So when you straighten and start to smooth out the body, you start to kind of unravel the crookedness back to the areas that are really, really holding on to dysfunction. Mm -hmm. And through that, you can then slowly move into finding out which major factors are involved in this problem. It is rare that there is one key link. That is not my finding. Once in a while, if the problem is acute and, um, and uh, simple, especially if it is of a kind of traumatic nature, somebody fell over, they hurt their knee, the knee has been a problem ever since, and slowly they got back pain. <clears throat> and yes, yeah, then, right. you key, then you have a then you can have a, a, a key link that you hit and everything unravels and go oh, and you think it's magic. Right. But most times that is not the case. <laughs> it's not that easy. The patient has come to you with a history of compensations over and over again. He has found ways to cope and cope and cope and cope. So. Uh, what you're looking at is a mishmash of compensations and causes. And you often have to work with all of them, find out which are more important, and address those, and let the unimportant ones fall away in the process. And be so careful that you're not like working on a compensation or an adaption. That's right. That is why it is important that as you uh, unravel this this web you do not get hypnotized by any one thing you must always go back and check your initial data because the data will tell you if the intervention has a maximum global effect on the CNS or not if you are caught at one particular area and you work at it but it does not change the data it is not the place to work. It's not a key link. That, it is that's not a key yeah. We came full circle there. Yeah, that, that was, was great. Yeah. A, it is not a key link, and you must not repeat or waste your time. You have to move on. And that is the job of this rehabilitation specialist, to have the courage to move on. Even if the next step is slightly uncertain, what you do know is that you cannot stay where you are. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's, yeah, right. We know that. Thing, yeah. yeah, that's the one thing you must come, you must agree on. Well, what's hard too is, I mean, the patient may be a hundred percent better, mm -hmm. even though your audits that you're doing, they're no better. Like they can come in and verbalize that they're better, and I mean that is a that's right. You know, relapse is on its way that's if you're right. unable to because the audit is is what you will listen to. Yonder always said the patient is an unreliable witness. They're going to lie, lie, lie. Yeah. And it's great if he feels good, but the audit tells you the truth. Mm. The audit does not lie because it is a direct inquiry with the central nervous system. You are asking it, how are you today? And he goes, I'm not good. <laughs> I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to uh, forget to ask you this. Mm -hmm. While we're talking about it, I want to know... So what am I missing if we're talking about Robert Lardner's audits? So we have, we've talked about gait, we've talked about posture examination, we've talked about trigger um, point chains, trigger point change, trigger points yes. in general, yes. um, muscle strength, muscle, muscle strength. strength, range of motion. Yeah, range of motion is underrated. I mean, and that's, yes, range of motion, range, range of motion is so sensitive. It is a, it is a instamatic camera into the central nervous system because it is changing all the time depending on how well integrated the central nervous system is. Do you utilize, or, and I've, I've heard different experts say different things on what I'm about to ask you, 
how reliable would, for example, checking deep tendon reflexes be in an audit in Robert Lardner system? I'm not talking about like af after like nerve root compromise and things like that. I'm just saying in general for superficial abdominal reflexes, are these things that we should be routine, re routinely checking on our patients or is it kind of not necessary? I think that the some reflexes are necessary to check. I still check the abdominal reflexes because they tell you how desensitized the patient has become. Right. Yes. So it is really important. And, you know, the abdominal wall is, some, is often ignored because it is such a personal area that we usually skip over it. <laughs> right. <laughs> Not to get too close. And because the patient is like, oh, what are you doing with my belly? Right. You know, so, but... The, 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 that test of um, the umbilical reflex when you test the quadrants is really important because it is so sensitive that when proprioception returns to the torso, and I mean integration, and I don't mean it was numb before, right. but when the quality of afferents returns to the torso, it is one of the first things to wake up. So you must uh, choose those, uh, those uh, data points and tests that really have, uh, have meaning in that they are sensitive. They, uh, some of the, uh, many of them cannot be too specific because if they're too specific, you can't use them for general assessment. And I'm but assuming you're also talking about uh, graphesthesia, stereognosis, That's all in that right. same category. All that. Mm -hmm. We have to speak the language of the brain. That is what it uses. So we have to understand that language. Without it, you are, you are guessing. Okay, I want to add on to that too. So in another system, a lot of our, not a lot of our listeners, but some of our listeners have taken a lot of the functional neurology courses mm -hmm. from the Carrick Institute. Mm -hmm. Now in their system, for example, checking cranial nerves, mm -hmm. checking blind spots, mm -hmm. this is all like a routine part of every patient that they're gonna examine. Do you think, what do you think about that? Like cranial nerves, for example, is that like should be done routinely or just as needed or what, can we change this function there? Have you found that your treatments are changing aberrancies in those findings? You can check. Uh, do you have to check it straight away on everybody? No, I don't think you do. But you must keep it in your mind that it is part of your armamentarium. It, it should not be forgotten because the, you may not check it on the patient who comes in with the shoulder sprain, but your next patient comes in and goes, you know, my leg is feeling a little clumsy or heavy. Then you must open your bag and choose an, uh, an altered array of tests that will give you the kind of data that you need to test this person against. Yeah. So there is no fixed, um, uh, there's no fixed test. Neuro exam. You no, just... it must, you must own enough information so that you have a base that allows you to change the emphasis of the tests you do to suit what you are suspecting this patient is presenting as a deficit of central nervous system integrity. Wow. Okay, so, and I wanna, I wanna harp on, we're, right now with evidence-based uh, manual therapy, we're running into uh, a time right now where people are telling us that you, there's no reliability in palpation you can't palpate, you know, Ooh, trigger it, points or trigger it. points and things like that. So, and I, to me, that is like an absolute incrimination on Dr. Levitt, which is Ooh. so unfair, Ooh. you know? So Ooh. could you maybe inspire slash motivate our listeners on how we can palpate, how this is a skill that is acquired and learned and how we can't throw that out and to be good manual therapists? Well, the, I can just say this, this your reaction, <laughs> if I caress your face or I slap it, I will have two very different responses. So the input 
is one of the most important things you can do. Manual therapy is not important because of the particular technique you use. It is important because you can summate afferents into the system. Mm. That is what manual therapy role is. You can sit and quarrel about the particulars of what you're doing till the cows come home. Can you touch this? Can't you touch that? Can't. Test it. Let the evidence be seen in the outcome of your intervention. I uh, can tell someone that, oh yeah, that is, uh, you're really skilled at palpating the psoas and someone else is not. Well, uh, that's great. But first of all, maybe the person doesn't even have a psoas. <laughs> so that may be there. But it doesn't mean that the efference I put into the abdominal area deep is useless. When I use manual therapy, I am changing efference in some way or form. And the response is as severe, as I said, as a caress or a slap. That's it. And you're going to get a response one way or another. So I don't see the, the importance in, in, in arguing about the particular technique you use. More important is that we can see the effect on the central nervous system and also on the psychosocial aspect of touch. You know, Sapolsky wrote about what made uh, baboons, uh, their hormone levels and stress hormones stay low, was because they were groomed by others within the, the, the troop. How often they were touched and by a more varied group was more important than anything else in keeping their stress levels down. Why zebras don't get ulcers That's is the reference right. there. What a great Why line. zebras don't get ulcers. So in your clinic, you have an uh, 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 you have an opportunity, one, to intervene manually, and you can always use your data to test whether that was effective or not. But you also have an opportunity to disrupt the neural bundles of trauma that is associated with your pre pre patient's presentation. Yeah. That is the goal, after all, is to bring in and summate enough afferents to break the trauma pods and give the brain a chance to reorganize its response to this. To this. Well, we always talk about affrontation to our patient, but what about the the therapist or the chiropractor, their affrontation, their ability That's to get true. better and feel. That's right. And and go ahead. We have a duty to keep on practicing that. Right. Because you will get better at it. It may not be your forte in the end, just as one might be a skilled manipulator and someone else is clumsy. But it doesn't mean that because of that you're going to totally ignore it and just throw it out in the bathwater because you're not very good at it. Uh, so refreshing to hear mm -hmm. this, Robert. What do you, um, I'm going to purposely leave this question open-ended. Mm -hmm. We kind of did a deep dive on Yanda. Mm -hmm. So tell me what you learned the most from Dr. Levitt because you've spent a ton of time with him. You've seen him work up a bunch of patients. What, do you, what did you take away from those encounters? Um, from the practical aspect, um, it was his, uh, the refinement of touch, um, that he was very careful with um, how he approached the palpation and what he inferred from it. You remember, uh, I, uh, you may not have been there, there was a time when we first met him and there was a discussion as to what manipulation meant, what was manipulation, how to define it. And many chiropractors were upset when he said, it's just mobilization, that's all you can say. You're just going to improve the range of motion. And they were like, no, it, it, it gives a, a blast to the CNS, it can remove disease because those are all influences. They start beating him with the dry spine. <laughs> That's right. 
He goes, no, those are consequences that may or may not occur, but they are not the definition of manipulation. And so he was very um, clear on what he was doing. He had this holistic approach, just like Yanda, trying to look for relationships, a, a model of tensegrity, how one side affected the other. He was always looking for that. And that is one of the most important things we can do, is to keep the wholeness of the, of the human animal within our rehabilitation ideas. You know, now we have specialists. I had a patient who said, I went to see a pelvic floor therapist. That's all she does all day. Well, that's great. She must be very good at it. <laughs> but if the human being is not one pelvic floor, you know, their legs, there's lungs, Thank God. the whole thing is attached. So if, so your, if your evaluation is only limited to that, you need to find a specialist who has a little bit more knowledge of everything so that he can go, okay, this is the relationship I see. And therefore, you know, if you're only going to evaluate that well and good, but the big picture has to be seen too. So a, a pelvic floor evaluation on its own is incomplete until you evaluate the whole person right. and put it together. Don't you think, too, Levitt was the first in true integrator? Like, he was integrating soft tissue in with manipulation. Yes. He was actually, I mean, you can read in his first books in the uh, 70s or 80s about the uh, biopsychosocial model. That's Before right. Before it was even cool that's to be talking right. about that. Yes. He was a very much the integrator. And that's the other aspect. Not only was he an integrator, but he was a humble one. Because he could, he would be the first to give up something for something better if he found that to be the Walk worst. away from, yeah. He would walk away from anything at all in order to accept something better. What a great better. quality. Oh yeah. That God. is, yeah, that was the, so there was the practical part, his skill, and this, this holistic approach, the integrator, and then a humble, very humble man, who could do that? Right. And he, uh, he, it's interesting who all was in his circle. So it's, it's interesting as we talk to MDT people, like they, you know, he was talking to Robin McKenzie a lot. He was best friends with Philip Greenman, Fred right. Mitchell, Bordilli. I mean, like. I, Myers. I mean, all of them. Yeah. Yes. I mean, just an endless um, inquisitiveness and interest in everybody else's work. Because he could see that, look, you are looking at Rome. We've all agreed we're looking at Rome, but we're not all standing in the same place. So if you really want a great picture of Rome, you talk to the other people standing in other positions who can fill in your picture of Rome. Right. Yeah. And that he was magnificent at. Well, moving right along, so let's... Uh... How much influence did uh, Voita reflex locomotion have in your existence as far as your career? How much are you still utilizing it now? Who is the classification of patient that it's like a non-negotiable we have to use reflex locomotion for? Could you talk about some of those ideas for us? Um, I think that the great gift um, that came my way was uh, Voita. Um, because it started and brought together many of the things that we had been seeing and trying to explain, but we did not have a unifying principle for the explanation of these phenomena or these rules. Um, whether it was the muscle imbalance of Yanda or the postural types that we saw, or trigger point chains, or um, movement dysfunction. Uh, the, the concept that Voita brought with posture being a, 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 an interaction of CNS environment and programming, and the sequence being 
more or less fixed and uh, achievable within five years of birth was very important. It gave us a template to explain um, uh, the movement blocks, the building blocks of movement, the importance, again, of the two stresses, pressure and gravity. How were they managed by the neonate until upright standing? And the role that those two stresses play in stimulating the development. Right. So, uh, in addition to that came a free chart of movement um, development and integration and complexity. You could see the milestones. And not only could you see the milestones, but he then went ahead and started telling you about afferent points that supported these development, that helped the program come along, and that were still active even in the adult. That was amazing. So not only did we get this, um, it brought to us an exercise scheme. It gave us the idea of fixed and mobile points. It gave us the idea of a steadied way in which a movement was layered on to the central nervous system as it matured. It gave us an insight as to how posture arose, that it was not something learned, and it never was. And you can change posture as much as you like, but posture still depends on afferent information for its survival. So it brought this, and then it brought also the direction of muscle pull, which I think is very unique. A concept. We talk about closed chain, open chain, etc. But nobody decided or talked about the direction in or which understood it. Or yeah, understood what it. Yeah, right. yeah, that's yeah. right. And with that, it revisited global chains that you could activate groups of muscles together with purpose. And then, on top of that, it gave you three patterns, contralateral, ipsilateral, and homologic patterns. Those are the three basic patterns of movement. They will never change as long as we are human in this form anyway. That's what we've got. And it means that you can now start to divide dysfunction mm -hmm. into right. these three buckets. Uh, buckets. <laughs> yes. um, I and Liebenson once many years ago we're sitting and we said, if that is the case, we should have these, these buckets should exist and we should be able to go, this person has a turning deficit, this person has a locomotion gait deficit, this person has a... I agree, yeah. Deficit. And that is what I'm, that is my quest, to assess somebody and go, you have problems with turning to the right. What was kind of noticeably omitted from all of Wojta's work was any idea or talking about the intra-abdominal pressure mechanism. Mm -hmm. Do you feel that was just an oversight? Do you feel like, or there was a reason that it wasn't talked about? What do you think? Um, mm. <laughs> <laughs> you stumping? Cigarette? <laughs> well, I would say this. It is in my experience and in my humble experience about okay the um the i don't know why it was not mentioned um i don't know that uh in the end um it seems from the recent research and from my experience that the role of intra-abdominal pressure is unique uh, in that it is a catalyst for stabilization. I think its role as a biomechanical stabilizer is overemphasized. Uh, because when we look at people move, they rarely take on some very different postures where biomechanically 
they would be limited if they had to rely on intra-abdominal pressure as the main stabilizing factor. Mm -hmm. It would mean that I would have to keep a, a, a relationship between the, the a container in such a way that I could move and maintain a certain amount of pressure at all times with a little wiggle room. Because what you're telling me is that should the pressure drop below a certain amount, I will lose the ability to stabilize and to be able to leverage force right. into the extremities. It would mean that we would have strict limitations in the ranges of motion we could, um, we could indulge in, because once we'd passed a certain amount, boom, you'd lose it and the whole thing would collapse. Right. But we do not see that. Exactly. In, in real life. Um, and secondly, even when we look at the MRI evidence, you don't see this sudden rush and drop of the diaphragm to get into position <laughs> to create this pressure. <laughs> like a rock falling yeah, off the building. I know. It would, just, it would have to move very quickly. It would probably cause a shudder through your body <laughs> each time it got to the position right. to, to do it. So... I, my sense is that the myotactic reflex, the stretching of muscles, which we know is, is so um, facilitatory to them. I just have to stretch the muscle a little bit, just like a tendon tap, and the muscle wakes up because what can I do for you? That would be more in keeping with what the intra-abdominal pressure does. It stretches and sends a signal that rapidly ripples through the whole container, going, hey, wake up, <laughs> it's time to work. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because one is that we know, now know that the transverse abdominis is selective, can be selective in its activity. Two, the density of the abdominal cavity and its contents is not uniform, nor its motility. So as I always said, it means that if you wanted to get stronger, all you need to do is to increase intra-abdominal pressure, in which case you just eat beans. Right. Yeah, you eat beans, go out, win the, 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 uh, win the trophy, come back home. Or I think we also act like it's, you know, isotropic forces exactly 360 it degrees. There's no, you know, there's no, there's no way. way. Yeah. There's no way it can happen. So, and it's not just an air pressure. It's also like a mechanical pressure against our inter internal organs. Right, and I think right. people... The term intra-abdominal pressure creates a lot of confusion. It creates a lot of confusion. I think that this myotactic reflex, which precedes all our other movements, we always pre-stretch somehow mm. in order to move. That's you remember when I when I went to national and they would say, "Well, here, you look at the chiropractor. He's not going to pre-stretch. He's going to load that joint, right. and then from there, he's just going to continue." And everybody was like, "Oh my God, that's really hard to do," and. I don't know any chiropractor that actually can do that on a consistent basis. Right. <laughs> because you always <laughs> re-stretch to gain force to do something. It's very difficult. Not right. To. So, and even if you put your pressure there, you have to pre-stretch somewhere else <laughs> sure. to do it. It's just the way the, mm -hmm. the body works. So I think that um, if we look at the restrictions around the fact that um, we don't have uniform motility, we don't have uh, equal 360 pressure, we don't often have the parallel diaphragms in, in movement, and yet we can produce quite significant forces. It can still we, thrive. Yeah, yeah, we can still thrive. We must revisit the emphasis and, and pay homage to the neurological aspect of facilitation of the, of the canister. When you get to really heavy loads, that's a different matter. Then the valsalva function steps in to assist you in creating biomechanical internal pressure that will help steady you. Right. Mm -hmm. uh, God, we could talk for three hours just on that. We might come back to that. So if we looked at Robert Lardner's toolbox, and it was a pie chart, what percent of that pie chart is made up with reflex locomotion at this point in your career? You're, I'm sure you're like me. It ebbs and flows, right? It ebbs and flows, but I will tell you what has, uh, has uh, morphed. The, rather than 
um, using the points to uh, just manually, reflexively stimulate the person. I am more likely using the points in active function. Um, I'm using them in handling, uh, meaning control, guiding function, and I'm using them as ways in which I can create exercises. By that I mean I, you know, the uh, support points or uh, points of support and um, uh, what should you call them? Uh, fixed points are not the same thing. You uh, support points are points that allow for um, the establishment of verticalization forces. I can lift my body up, I can move forward over that point. But I can create fixed points in many areas that become fixed points for muscles to pull to. Mm. So, um, for example, I can be, I can have three support points on my knees and my hand, and I create a fixed point on the phasic arm in any of these positions, and I block it. And then it becomes a fixed point. It's not a supporting point, right. but it's a That's fixed good, yeah. point. And I change the direction of muscle pull. So we see this in the treatment of scoliosis, for example, that we are using fixed points to change the direction muscle of muscle pull to affect the spine. So these ideas become uh, integrated into exercise choice. Which leg is going to be forward? Which leg is going to be back? Will I have the patient push their arm against something whilst they're doing that movement, or will the arm be free? Which directions of muscle pull am I interested in in getting this patient to experience? So that is it. So the Voiter uh, concept underlies, I would say, 100% of all what I do. The technique is probably... 20, 10 percent. Which brings me to another uh, important question, I think. Do you think it's a mistake at this point, now that we teach our DNS courses, reflex locomotion is no longer part of that curriculum. Do you think that because of that, the people leaving these courses are missing that key foundational piece of information? Or do you think that, uh, what are your thoughts on that? I, I just say that because I feel like you and I benefited mm -hmm. from, yes. and it's easy for us to say now, oh, reflex locomotion is not important, but mm -hmm. it, we, is. We, it, is. It, it is. It is. It is. I think uh, it is important because we have to understand that that function is the basis of how we create exercise. As we, whether we know it or not, we put people into positions and we are asking afferent input from wherever they're supporting to create a certain movement pattern. That's what we do all right. the time. Now, the reflex points and positions are special because they help us access uh, uh, the child's brain and we have at least a template of where to start. It gives us a starting point. It gives people the understanding that motor evocation of motor movement is dep dependent on ideal centration and ideal support and fixed points. If they do not understand that, they just think it's another exercise. Mm. They just go, well, you know, I can roll on the floor and get up on one knee and go back down and turn to the other side. Yeah. Just baby exercises. I know, they're, they're just baby exercises to them. And therefore, it loses the deeper implication of why we chose uh, these positions and that we discovered them. They were not handed to us on a plate. This was trial and error and the observation of phenomena. You know, it's one thing to invent a McKenzie exercise by coming in and finding somebody has slept on the wrong, in the wrong position. Right. <laughs> That's right. And then you add to it. It's quite another matter 
to understand that the position of the shoulder, the scapula, and the other and the contralateral leg changes the ability to lift your head. That is something big. It's massive. I run into this huge conundrum in teaching because I don't realize until like I have interns and students follow me how much I utilize reflex locomotion. We got room to like what you know, but I also use it a lot in my assessment. I feel mm -hmm. like it. It's a way to get rid of like neurologic noise in the system. Right. And then I feel like things, whether it's a trigger point or whether it's joint blockage, can then be felt so right. so much easier. Right. So I'm assuming you're kind of in that same camp. Yes. Yeah. You can use it. And therefore, it's important uh, in the assessment and treatment of, of patients, you have collected your data, you have done your uh, uh, provocative testing, you have then decided, okay, the first thing you'll do is to unravel the posture and restore it to its uh, best uh, available for this moment uh, st status. And along with that, you must try to bring down and balance this autonomic, uh, the silent autonomic machinery behind this sympathetic person. And there you can see reflexive techniques like Voita, PRRT, all these things that have a global effect from their, inter, from their local intervention. And you can use them to calm down and, as you said, remove the static that is, is just um, contaminating the picture. You can wash it free and then you can see more of what is clear. And from that, you can help now to decide from the, the DNS movement tests or the functional test and the synergy test, what is your best intervention. I must say that also it is important, as we talked about, that the neurological assessment continues constantly in the background. Because you must be noting uh, if, if you had, uh, uh, if you had as, uh, assessed whether it is saccades, uh, saccades, pursuits, con uh, convergence, uh, graphesthesia, um, the Romberg test, all, Blind those, spots, things, all oh, yes. those things should be in your, still in your background and you're visiting them to go, how is the brain feeling about my intervention? That alone is your key to good rehabilitation. I got a sneaky suspicion that we're not putting enough importance in everything that you just said. Like that may be a key audit and we'd probably be mesmerized with the changes that we're making and all these That's things right. that we're talking about, but we're not checking we're it. We're not so. checking it. Right. That's the thing. And um, without that ability, uh, the more you check, the better buy-in your patient has. And you do too. Uh, because yes, it, because you can see the changes. The changes. The magic must occur in your room. <laughs> so on this first podcast, because we're the second half of this is going to be more about Robert Lardner and some of your uh, original thoughts, but let's close out and talk about um, someone who's had a huge influence on all of us here, and that's uh, Pavel. Yes. So and it, I think this just perfectly comes full circle. We talked Yanda, we talked Levitt, we talked Voita. What what are Collage's huge contributions to the world of rehabilitation? What are your what are your big takeaways from DNS and a hundred years from now, you know, what will we look back on and say that, you know, Pavel gifted us? Pavel um, gifted us by transforming a technique that was mostly rumored to be entirely a pediatric technique into making it universal and accessible in practical terms to even the person who had not taken a vertical. That was a great gift because um, if you are waiting to take a boy to class, <laughs> like, you're going to wait a long time. <laughs> so, if you're waiting for the book to be translated. Exactly. Yeah. So he was kind enough to go what if. And that is what I, you know, another great influence was Dr. Goodhart. George Goddard. I cannot thank him enough. 
really, if I were to think of that gift, I cannot thank him enough. And when I met him, he was exactly as his name was, a good heart. Just humble and giving. He spoke to me as if we were equals in the rehabilitation field. A towering giant. And he had time for somebody whose name he'd never heard of. So these people who say, what if, are the people we really must thank because they step outside the box. And they go, what if I did this instead? What if I did that? And they open these boxes. They open up whole vistas for future generations to explore. Don't you think, too, like, as far as his contribution of intra-abdominal pressure, I feel like, I mean, we've known through Chateau's work and others, the respiratory function of the diaphragm. But don't you think Pavel was kind of the first one and you can find it in Hodge's work mm -hmm. also, but I felt like it didn't turn the dial that much, mm -hmm. even though it was there. Mm -hmm. I feel like DNS has basically Push exposed that's right. the postural function of the diaphragm. Yes, that's right. I remember when um, Levitt had done uh, some uh, test with Schladal and said that the diaphragm had postural uh, role and the and a respiratory role and they had shown it by having people go up on their toes uh on the balls of their feet and they took the x-rays to show the different positions of the diaphragm uh, uh -huh. as it was activated that was years ago um Moishish in her book wrote about the importance of the of the diaphragms in the global war and pavel brought it to life and simplicity and integration uh, by his examples. You know, he started to show you through practical application how it was changing, how he could change it, how uh, the stimulation and the position could change this. And again, he could show you the change in trigger points, in range of motion, in, in ability, in posture, spontaneous change. And there's other, still the three data points that I'm talking about. Yeah. yeah. So that he really, he really opened our eyes and um, the DNS model as it stands is a, is a tribute to this uh, process of understanding and the hard work that he and the whole Prague School have um, put into creating a, a, a body of knowledge from which you can hang many techniques and ideas, but that, that, um, that nucleus is really quite strong. It, it explains so many things. It's an operating system. It's yeah. an operating system on its own, awesome. exactly. It is an operating system and one that lives. It is slowly being transformed and updated but it is an operating system. And that is what many techniques are not. They are not operating systems. I they think are programs, but they are not operating yes. systems. We always say DNS explains the why behind That's everything right. that your patient walks in with. Yes. It you have many interventions to do the what, right? right? To, to yeah, fix the what, what, if you will. But, but the why. The why. Mm -hmm. That is a big contribution. And it is really a master operating system. Yeah. yeah. It, it, yeah, sometimes you may not even be using the principles of DNS. However, you're looking at the case through the lens. Yes, of yes, you're, yes that is it. Um, something that gives you that amount of latitude is really to be, to be valued. We had a sweet spot, too, I think, Robert. We were both really, really lucky <coughs> when Pavel was still traveling a bunch. Yeah. I mean, we were basically witnessing Michael Jordan at his craft. Like, yes. you know, before Pavel was Pavel yes. and, you know... Uh, literally a celebrity yes. and uh we saw him do some magical things he did indeed um it is a two-way street because as the pts took over for uh, teaching courses for him we lost seeing the master craftsmen at work right um, and that's no reflection on the pts they are excellent mm -hmm. every which one of them but it is always um, humbling to see the originator because 
he is creating on the moment what he believes in. And um, it is, um, that's a different kind of magic. No one can reproduce that. Right. Uh, that kind of creation because it is unique to the brain that is creating it <laughs> at that moment. And you can only stand there as witness to it. Yeah. So that was fantastic. I, I think the thing I always took away from that too was his ability to forecast what problems the patient already had, whether that was structural mm -hmm. damage in a knee joint, mm -hmm. meniscal problems, mm -hmm. discal problems, and not doing any kind of orthopedic test or any mm -hmm. kind of imaging mm -hmm. solely by mm -hmm. feeling the response that's of the right. body. That's right. That is uh, fantastic. And I think that is what we each have to find what tools we have to aspire to some kind of analysis that is as impressive. Maybe not as, not as um, stunning in its way, but whatever your assessment is, it must be reproducible. It must be objective and it must be measured. If you can observe those three scientific rules, you have a tool you can use. Mm. That's really it. And it might not have been well researched yet, but you still have a tool you can use. Mm -hmm. And that is my belief. You must, you must venture outside the research. We must look, we must ask ourselves, what if, and start to experiment in finding tools that will be reliable, that can be tested down the line, so that we can discard some that are not so useful mm. and find new ways of seeing the body in its integrated whole. If we uh, emphasize too much specialization, it will take us for even longer to integrate. What a perfect stopping point. I think that's for this one. Yeah. And then uh, I think to to sum it up, have the courage to go down a path you may not know yes, where it leads. You have to. Yeah. Yes. Whether that's with your patients or exactly I mean, or by yourself. You have to. Yeah. It is it is your duty. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. That's awesome. I love it. Awesome. Well, what a great ending. And yeah, what a, what an awesome uh, conversation. Holy smokes. Um, all right. We'll catch the next one. All right. Perfect. Awesome. So good.